Hello, and welcome to Real Mindful. This is where we speak mindfully about things that matter. We meet here twice a month to introduce you to some of the teachers, thinkers, writers, and researchers who are engaged in the mindfulness movement. You'll hear all kinds of conversations here about the science of mindfulness, the practice of mindfulness, and the heart of it. I'm Stephanie Domet. I'm the managing editor at Mindful Magazine and Mindful.org, and this is Real Mindful. I, I remember going to the Philadelphia Zoo and watching a lion just pacing back and forth in this small cage and and how it evoked in me a, a, a sense of dread or anger or something. It's like a poor thing, you know, it's like it's it, it can't go anywhere. There's, there's no nothing of interest and, and so limiting. That's Ed Adams. He's a psychologist and the founder of Men Mentoring Men, or M3, a not-for-profit organization that provides peer coaching for men. Ed's also the co-author of Reinventing Masculinity, The Liberating Power of Compassion and Connection. He wrote that alongside Edward Fraunheim, a journalist, researcher, and speaker who often focuses on masculinity and workplace culture, as well as the intersection between the two. So coming up on Real Mindful today, a conversation with Ed Adams and Edward Fraunheim about their book and the role mindfulness can play in liberating masculinity. But first, Mindful Senior Editor Kylie Ross dropped by to talk about our annual meditation challenge, Mindful 30. Hi, Kylie. Hi, Stephanie. So the Mindful 30, this is the fifth year for this challenge. Can you talk a little bit about what's involved and who's involved this year? Definitely. So every year we bring together eight teachers to guide us through 30 days of meditation, um, usually for the month of September. This year, uh, the theme is resilience, which was pretty interesting given the year that we've had. And um, interesting to, you know, go through what resilience means to all of these teachers. We have an amazing lineup. Um, we have Toby Scruggs Hussein, Rashid Hughes, founding editor Barry Boyce, Dr. Sarah King, um, Sharon Salzberg, Dr. Mark Burton, uh, Dr. Shalini Mal Bilm, and Sarah Ivanhoe. Wow, that's a star studded lineup. Yeah, it was exciting. just amazing to work with them. And so, what kinds of practices are they serving in this, in this 30 day um, excursion? So over the 30 days, um, they are serving practices that are kind of bite-sized. So 10 to 15 minutes, you're able to wake up and do this practice um, just to go through the entire month. And uh, the practices vary. You know, we have mindful movement. We have practices, uh, breath awareness practices, um, all kinds of practices. And now we're, we're a little bit into the month of September, but I could start this anytime and receive it every day for 30 days. Is that right? You can. You can sign up any day throughout the month of September and start as if it's day one. What do I need to be able to, to embark on this? You need very little. Um, you need a few minutes, really. You can sit down wherever you are. You, know, um, you can download the practice, take it with you. Um, so I would say, I guess all you need is an internet connection. <laughs> Amazing. I have that. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for, for dropping by and talking about this with us. Thank you, Stephanie. That's Kylie Ross, a senior editor here at Mindful and Mindful.org. You can find out more about Mindful 30 at Mindful.org. We'll also pop a direct link into the show notes for you. Now, in the October issue of the magazine, Mindful Coach Chris Perraro writes about a subject close to his heart, how mindfulness can allow men to show up as their full selves. Here's a little bit from the beginning of his article. Chris writes, Once in a while, during a typical hectic day in our household, my wife will turn to me wearing a pretend astonished smile and say, Chris, did you know that we have three boys? Although it seems like she's just playfully stating the obvious, I hear her words like the ringing of a generation's old mission bell, a reminder of what's most important to me, 
Each time, I'm struck by the responsibility of raising our boys in an era when masculinity, in the way it's long been defined, is being called to expand. Now, if you haven't had a chance to read Chris's essay yet, I highly recommend it. I will link to it in our show notes, or you can find it in the October issue of Mindful Magazine. You'll also find, in both those places, an excerpt of a conversation our senior editor Amber Tucker had with the aforementioned Eds, Ed Adams and Ed Fraunheim, also known in this conversation as Ed A and Ed F, about their book Reinventing Masculinity. Ed A's dogs were in the room playing, so you will hear the odd squeal of a squeaky toy in the recording of this conversation. And Amber started off by asking Ed Adams how they arrived at the idea of confined masculinity. So the term toxic masculinity was um, just a common phrase that was being used in the culture. And both Ed and I early on uh, decided we really... uh, don't like that term because it seems to implicate all men and shame men for being men. And, um, but, and the issue isn't, isn't uh, toxic masculinity. Uh, The, the issue was um, uh, how our idea of what it means to be a man was so limited. And so uh, that limitation uh, 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 the word that describes that is confined, um, sort of that image of, I, I remember going to the Philadelphia Zoo and watching a lion just pacing back and forth in this small cage and, and how uh, it evoked in me a, 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 a sense of, of dread or anger or something it's like a poor thing you know it's like it's it it can't go anywhere there's nothing there's there's no nothing of interest and and so limiting um and so uh uh uh, we 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 uh focused on on confined and, and mentioned toxic i think once or twice in reference to popular culture in the book uh because we wanted to stay away from that particular terminology um, and so that's where, uh, that's, that's how it originated. And then it began to, we began to describe how it's confining, uh, you know, first of all, uh, what, what beliefs has the social research literature, uh, demonstrated, um, has typically confined men, uh, in the past and in the present. And frankly, if we don't change it, we're, we're, we're going to have a rather bleak future. The one other thing I would say about the confined term that I really liked, that it was it's sort of like the, at the root of what can be toxic behaviors, you could say, that when men are in, the, in that cage, like Ed talked about, uh, they are in trouble. You know, a lot of bad uh, sort of healthy, uh, unhealthy uh, behaviors or, or, or attitudes develop. It also captures this way in which we think we're so separate from each other. Uh, in Western culture, especially, I think this idea that, you know, we were, we have to be a self-made man, we're an island or a rock. So there was a lot about the term that really grabbed us once, once we kind of started playing around with it. We wanted to sort of see that in, what was the root of it? And how can we describe this masculinity problem in a more neutral way that, that could be accessible and, and, and appreciated by people, especially men? The idea of confined um, also allowed us to uh, appreciate the traditional roles that men have played, like protector and provider. There, the, we weren't. Uh, uh, we're trying to underscore that um, that those have enormous value, uh, but that they have been too too confined, too limiting, uh, so that. Um, uh, most men perceive protecting, as we mentioned in the book, it's like, yeah, I'll protect my family. I have a 357 Magnum right next to the bed. And God forbid somebody enters this house so I could protect my family. Um, or uh, uh, provide uh, is typically looked at as um, having uh, an economic uh, fluidness enough to provide uh food and shelter and there's nothing there's nothing inherently that we're saying that that there's enormous value in that. 
I have two dogs and they're playing with each other. I apologize. Uh, uh, but providing is providing emotional warmth. Providing is providing um, availability, uh, being present with people you love. And, and it's uh, providing is taking care of, of your community and that the larger, larger earth of uh, protecting is, has something to do with um, being able to protect uh, your, your, yourself and your immediate family from emotional distress uh, or traumas. Um, uh, again, it's being present, it's being available uh, and being playful too uh, with, with, uh, with people. So what our, our goal was to take those traditional roles and say, um, why are they so, why, why are they perceived so small? Let's, let's make it big. Let's, let's let it rip. Yeah, no, that's, that's so interesting. And um, I, I noticed uh, that you talk about not only those traditional male roles as kind of, uh, you know, expanding them or turning the classic conception on their heads, um, but also some emotional qualities like um, the chapter you, where you talk about compassion, I thought was really intriguing, you know, that there are, um, that there are kind of ways that you could say are more feminine and ways that are more masculine to express compassion. Um, but they're both compassion. Would you be able to say a little more about that? Well, see, I, uh, our, our, our perception is that compassion requires enormous guts and courage because it, forces you to actually witness and experience the suffering within yourself or others. Um, I, you know, I'm old enough to have lived through the Vietnam era and every night on TV, I was young, but um, 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 uh, you would, the, the, the um, reporters were on the front lines. So you saw, you saw Vietnamese as well as American soldiers get shot or, or lying there bleeding and getting blood and uh, you would hear the bombs and so on. And uh, it, it, what it did was evoked uh, a great deal of compa compassion by witnessing that in the American public, which helped uh, end that war. Uh, and, but if you look at something like the, uh, the war in Afghanistan or Iraq, uh, what we were shown were images of computer games. A target was focused on, and then you'd see a puff. And uh, there was, you didn't see the people who were crying and the people who were bleeding. And, and, um, and so uh, it, it created an emotional distance from the suffering. Um, and, um, and that was intentional uh, because uh, the government learned from the Vietnam War that if you show what's actually going on, it's going to, it's going to change the complexion of the public's opinion. So uh, being compassionate is a, a truly courageous act because it's no longer avoiding the, um, the realities of, of life. Um, and so we see it as, as, as something that uh, takes a great deal of, of, of guts and courage to, to actually be a compassionate person. And can I just add a bit to that? And, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I think what Ed was, you know, sparking for me is this idea that it is manly. You know, you could say that this courage piece that we've often identified as men, men's uh, traits or a, man, a manly trait is, is needed for this work. Uh, and to your point earlier, Amber, about the sort of feminine masculine expressions of compassion, I think what we're getting at ultimately is this notion of this is a human trait. Uh, and, and it's men's birthright. It's, it's part of being primates. It's, it's, it's really wired into us. Uh, men have expressed it in a more implicit ways and we're calling on men to, to identify it and, and proudly talk about it explicitly now. Um, and that's really, you know, from my perspective of studying the workplace, it's needed uh, to be emotionally intelligent, emotionally vulnerable, to create psychological safety, to succeed in work today. Uh, and I think, you know, it, it helps men live a fuller life, you know, a bigger life to, to Ed's uh, reference earlier, when we can see compassion as, as as ours as, as human beings. 
Yeah. Wow. There's so much in, in all of that. Um, I, what I think of right away is I, I, I know F you have done, or Ed F you have done. You just call me F. Oh, no, no, no. Um, you, I know, um, you've done, um, work formerly kind of in the, in the, um, evolving workplace space. Um, and, uh, I'm, I'm curious how you see these, um, new more expansive um uh, or less limited masculine traits kind of helping to um transform workplaces and make them more more equitable more sustainable any of those any of those those things we're kind of looking for now yeah i love that question emma i think you know to bring it back to to the mindfulness piece that that your magazine is about and that maybe the article is about is that when men are willing to be mindful, uh, when they're willing to uh, pause, you know, and be a bit more about presence as opposed to action, um, that builds self-awareness. Uh, and that self-awareness is vital today to recognize privilege uh, and, and the ways in which the workplace has not been equitable uh, for all employees, all people there. Uh, and to start realizing, well, we maybe need to, to do take some steps to, to distribute power more equitably to uh, make it clear that other pe- people can can uh, achieve promotions in more fair ways and really look at bias. Um, so that's that's a piece of it. And, and so is what we were just talking about with the uh, willingness to be compassionate and vulnerable and, and, and emotionally intelligent, because that's where we're realizing that workplaces need to be successful. It's, it's proven in data, like from Amy Edmondson's work at Harvard on emotion, on psychological safety, the COVID pandemic has proved it dramatically more powerfully with everyone realizing it's okay not to be okay. You know, we're, we're all kind of wrestling with emotional well-being when we're stuck in our houses for a month, for a year, practically. Uh, so I think, you know, as we put in the book and I got to give a nod to Ed's wife, Marilee Adams, like she, she helped us, co- you know, use this phrase, soft skills are success skills today. And these soft skills are really what the, this newer liberating masculinity is, is incorporating into uh, the male ethos. Things like compassion, things like connectivity, things like uh, vulnerability, uh, things like mindfulness of, of really uh, letting yourself become more mindful, aware of, of what you're feeling and, and who you are in the world. I, I would love to hear, Ed A., if you have any thoughts on um, about the, the psychological struggles that we're facing. And as a psychologist, um, it's, it's clear how um, maybe ma- male people in particular are having certain kinds of struggles with, um, you know, the stay at home and and uh, the kind of loss of control, you know, that, <laughs> that we've all had to face and process in the last year. Um, do you have any thoughts around that? Yeah. I, 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 one thought is that it's, it's um, that, uh, the impact of of COVID and and all of its uh, implications uh, have been relatively gender free. You know, it's like both sides are suffering. You know, it's like um, uh, both are making compromises. Both are are improvising in ways that they have people have we haven't had to improvise before. We're parenting in ways that we haven't had to parent before, or being in relationship with each other. Um, but one of the things that, uh, that, it, uh, I noticed clinically is that, um, with people being in so such close proximity to each other for such extended periods of time, it's putting a strain on, uh, emotional skills. Um, uh, so, uh, those who are reasonably well equipped to, to have good deep deeper conversations once in a while or to face life issues or to talk about what they need or want uh, are faring better than those who are uh, uh, with each other and uh, either uh, afraid to talk about those things or get angry when they talk about those things or feel blamed or feel uh, uncomfortable uh, in that territory. And so, uh, generally speaking, um, uh, women have had more tolerance for uh, emotional uh, uh, talk and emotional interaction. Um, um, it's not that men are incapable of that. It's just that they haven't been in the environment. 
you know, in, in, in we talk a lot about men mentoring men in the book or the, the men's organization, uh, M3, um, which clearly demonstrates that men are hungry for and eager for and quite capable of going very deep and emotional uh, and, and being very vulnerable with each other. But um, uh, they have to learn it, uh, typically with uh, men uh, uh, haven't had that experience within their families and, and particularly with their fathers. And, and uh, you know, Robert Bly, the poet said, when a group of men get together, can some form of violence be far behind? Uh, and that, that means not just uh, the potential for physical violence, but for shaming or being put down and so on. But when men find themselves in a safe environment um, and and become convinced that it's safe, uh, boy, they can really let it rip because they want to go there. They're capable of that. It's not like, like they're, 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 they, they have some kind of like uh, brain matter that's missing. It's just the opportunities have been missing. You know, uh, uh, I had uh, in M3, uh, uh, a gay man, a gay couple said, who would have ever thought that our best friends are, uh, they're part of M3. They once said, uh, who would have ever thought, we would have never thought that our, our best friends are straight. Uh, another man who's Jewish and grew up afraid of non-Jews uh, uh, for all the obvious reasons, um, once um, uh, said, I, I can't believe that I finally feel safe in the company of men who aren't Jewish, you know? Uh, and, and so uh, there's a lot of let go that can occur uh, when men feel safe and they, they can go very playful, sort of what I refer to as living on the horizontal plane, but they could also go profoundly vertical and spiritual. You know, in a in a spirit kind of way, you know, um, and encourage each other to um, uh, to be more uh, mindful of themselves and of of others and of what they feel and what they need and what they want. Um, uh, men have have come out uh, in M three. Men have uh, made career changes. Men have. Uh, made marital changes, gotten married, uh, decided to have children, or, or, or decided that uh, it's okay not to, uh, and they discuss these things with each other, and by doing so, um, have the advantage of the wisdom of a whole lot of men they feel safe with to think things through. Can I? And I, I love that all this story uh, and, and these examples from M three and and. And Amber, I, I've been completely convinced by what he's saying, having met these guys, like they're just guys and yet they're so deep into that's point about the vertical development. I wanted to make one little um, caveat about what Ed said at the beginning about the, the, the gender neutral, relatively gender equal experience of the pandemic. And, and this is something that I've seen from the workplace is that there have been more burdens put on women as caregivers during this time you know, and, and maybe this is not something you've seen, but like there's a lot more women who've left the workplace than men, for example. But I do think your point more generally is true about, you know, the emotional taxation of this time certainly has affected both sides. I just wanted to make sure we, we let you know, Amber, we're aware of, of that piece of caregiving falling back on, on women, mm. especially. Good point. Yeah, definitely. There are, there are certainly... Um, there's certainly been give and take on, on both sides, I would, I would say, but yeah, of different weights. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate it as you were gesturing there to at a, um, in, in the book that you mentioned, um, reflection and mindful practices were, um, you know, some of the things that helped you to, um, redefine traits like emotional sensitivity, exuberance, and camaraderie as being worthy, um, and that those have improved your lives as a result. Um, so you're talking about Ed F then, right? I think yes. Said a. Got it. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I know Ed does reflection stuff too, but that was, I think, talking about me in particular. I think, yeah, you're right. Um, I, I would love to hear both your perspectives on this. Um, but I, I'm curious what kinds of mindful 
uh, mindfulness practices or books or teachers or other kinds of meditation um, you mm-hmm. you found most helpful yourselves and maybe what kinds um, you may have done with with other men as well, if that's applicable? Well, um, I, I deeply appreciate the work of Ellen Langer um, and the idea of um, most people associate mindfulness with meditation. You know, somehow it seems connected and um, um, uh, and it's not untrue, but uh, her way of looking at things that it is paying attention to things that are different or things that are unique or to, to pay attention to, um, uh, to, to be other than mindless, you know, uh, we talks a, a lot about mindlessness and just going through life, uh, in a rote kind of way. Ironically, um, uh, I gave blood about, um, two weeks ago and with the red cross and, um, make a long story short, um, I was watching the way they were interacting with me and, and with other people donating. And then the woman stabbed me twice, couldn't get into a vein. And then she put something in her computer that she looked at me and she said, you're done. I said, I haven't given blood. She said, I put the wrong code in the computer. And that was the only explanation I got. So I, I, I was a little ticked off because that was about two and a half hours of my time to come and go. So I wrote the president of the Red Cross and I said, here's what happened. And if this continues to happen, people are going to be discouraged. I have gotten two profoundly important responses from two different people from the Red Cross. And I was just composing one about... Um, uh, a response to the man who wanted to know what happened. And I was talking about the, uh, the need for uh, people who are acting compassionately to be validated, to be seen as, as, as what they're doing is important um, and making a contribution, um, which they already know. But um, uh, I think I was suggesting that uh, maybe they ought to pay more attention in their training on this, you know, and, and so it has practical application in, in everyday life, um, uh, to, um, uh, cause some people could give blood and if they don't, if they don't feel connected with, they're not going to go back. They're not going to do it again or they'll, um, and so mindfulness is, is, is necessary with the staff to be able to be, um, that everybody is unique and, and to see each person as an individual uh, and, and to, um, and to, and to uh, uh, be uh, able to respond to people in their sense of humor or their anxieties or, or whatever they're presenting. Um, so uh, I was trying to make an example of something, how that mindfulness is applied in, in, everyday life if i could it's not just that. meditation yeah can i can i build on that amber a little bit or please yes yeah. um i think what, ed what i love what you're saying with that example is, is the common con- connection between mindfulness and what i what we talk in the book about is consciousness it's sort of how aware are you of how your behavior affects others how you are sit, you know how you're showing up in the world you know we really are calling for men to develop a much grander global consciousness that I think is about, you know, our place here and our role here. We're not the most important person in the room, which we often think we are. Uh, And I think mindfulness can help us get to that self-awareness, that situational self-awareness is a term I've heard recently, Uh, you know, and and so to go back to your, you know, your original question about the practices, Amber, for me, as I mentioned in the book, like yoga has been a major one for me that is included uh, a mindfulness and a spirituality element to to that practice, uh, a meditation practice I, I picked up from a, um, a psychiatrist I saw for a time about anxiety issues, uh, and that's been very helpful to me. And I would say that you know the workplace is becoming a more mindful place. Um, 
through, especially during this pandemic, where we're now leaders uh, and organizations and, and, and all, everyday employees are realizing we need to do things like check in, uh, check ins, and see how we're doing. You know, being mindful of each other in that kind of more late person term, but also things like breathing exercises and mini meditations to start meetings. Um, so I'm hopeful that we are all of us realizing the power of mindfulness to to really build better workplaces, better personal. Uh, satisfaction and ultimately a better world. Yeah, you know, one of my uh, one of my art mentors, uh, his name is Alok A L O K. He's a, a Zen um, Buddhist um, uh, artist, and uh, he um, uh, I took from him uh, that there are four things that are. Um, uh, things that stick in my, my mind and I, I preach in one way or the other with the people that I treat. And that is to be present, uh, to be available, uh, to be playful, and to be not knowing. I just, I, I just love those four things. And uh, to be present, available, playful, and not knowing. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I try to... Um, uh, I, uh, uh, use those not not even in those words, but to um, uh, in times of stress and times of of COVID and so on. Uh, how can we become more present, more available, more playful? And by not knowing means more of an open mind. Um, you know, not prejudging, being being mindful rather than mindless. You know. Yeah, yeah. Letting that curiosity kind of come up and, and naturally express itself. Is that kind of the idea? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought that I didn't know what he was talking about. Now I understand it's your philosophy. Yet. Um, <laughs> trying to be playful here. And <laughs> present and available. Um, I, uh, I really liked um, where you talked about um, the five C's at one point. Um, the curiosity. Mm-hmm courage, compassion, connection, and commitment, um, and kind of um, what, the, what the interplay of, of those is and how they all kind of mutually support each other. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, you could just say a little bit more about those, those qualities, anything that seems you know, particularly um, relevant to sort of a, a mindfulness discussion. Like for, for me, like I read those and I was like, oh, those are all, those are all qualities that we try our best to elevate in, in our work um, and that we really see being elevated by the leaders that we work with. Um, mm-hmm. So kind of a little bit more about those from, from the perspective of expanding masculinity. Go ahead, Ed, would, you could start. Sure. I, I thank you for seeing those connections, Amber. And, and I think uh, it's interesting that we did those five C's and I started doing some workshops about um, reinventing masculinity at work in particular. And I've already added a, a sixth C, which is contemplation, uh, which is, this, you know, explicitly calling out mindfulness because Ed and I, in our five C's, we did call out, we talked about, especially under the commitment one, maybe that this is part of how you're going to make progress and stick with it. This journey toward liberating masculinity is through uh, a contemplative practice and I, I feel really strong, and I think it does too, that this is really important part of, of how men are going to advance uh, to, to make space for a, uh, even if it's, a, you know, there's multiple ways of doing it. Like it's, I think, as getting at like journaling, you know, meditation, yoga, other kinds of, uh, you know, spiritual uh, practices or prayer. Uh, but I think it's, it's something that men have poo pooed. You know, there, it's, we've been so much about doing and achieving. But just the being and 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 the paying attention to the journey uh, is, is something that we have not uh, acknowledged enough. And so I think uh, calling that out, uh, with, whether it's the commitment C uh, or, or adding one, uh, is really important. And um, you know, I think we're seeing some. I'm seeing we're seeing more and more men embrace these things, which which I, I'm really hopeful about. Yeah. And would you add add to that? Yeah. Um... The curiosity part is um, 
it has something to do with the not knowing I was talking about before. It's like wondering. I, I love that word to wonder. To one, wonder what you're thinking right now, Amber. I wonder what Ed's thinking right now. I wonder. I wonder what I'm. Um, um, uh, what my uh, wife may need from me a little bit later. I, you know, it's like um, it's it's a state of mind that um, keeps you. Um, emotionally intelligent in many ways it's 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 uh, the 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 theory of mind uh, uh idea that you stay curious about about um who who's showing up right now like what man is needed right now you know? um and uh, it might be the tender me it might be the forceful me it might be the uh, the, 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 uh, playful me, you know, who, who's, who's needed that. And that requires the curiosity part. Um, and then to act on it, uh, to actually, um, um, uh, takes the courage to step out up very often out of, out of one's more mindless role of just rote, you know, just rote behavior. Um, and, uh, to be more, um, uh, uh, have the courage to uh, to deliver the goods, to deliver what's needed uh, from uh, the man who is needed in that moment. Um, and uh, of course, you know, the idea of uh, one of the major thrusts of the book is, as Ed mentioned before, is to allow men to see that compassion is, is it's built into the equipment. It's, we, we are all born with the capacity uh, and the desire for con, uh, uh, compassion, but for men to see it as manly, for men to see it not disconnected from manliness. And, and that uh, I dream of the day when, when qualities of masculinity are, are uh, seen uh, to include compassion as manly. Um, and then uh, uh, the, the notion of connection uh, is um, we're, what we're trying to do there is expand that, that we're, uh, we're uh, maybe the better uh, term is interconnected, how vitally uh, reliant we are upon each other. Um, uh, and, um, and then, um, you know, the, the last one being commitment to change, to, to, to use these awarenesses, to use this mindfulness in a way that is uh, to make a commitment to actually, actually act um, with curiosity and courage and compassion and connection um, in a variety of different ways and in all of our settings that we find ourselves. I love what you said about the interconnectedness, Ed, and that just sparked for me, you know, we talk in the book about the, seeing ourselves as connected to the earth and, and that men have, have for thousands of years uh, really seen a, ourselves as, as masters of the earth or controllers of the earth. Uh, and I think there's an, an unreal opportunity for mindfulness practices uh, that include natural settings or, or reflecting on nature, which you often uh, I, there's growing a, a, like forest bathing is, is taking off during the pandemic. This idea of really, you know, paying attention to the plants living around us, you know, and trees. My son is, you know, wants to study redwood trees. That is a, a real opportunity, I think, and a growing appreciation of our connection to nature, not just our separateness again from it, but our interdependence, interconnection, as I'd use the term, and the need to uh, expand our consciousness by reflecting that we're, we're part of this system. Not, we're not like the boss of it or, or you know, about trying to wrestle it to the ground, but to actually like appreciate we're, we're connected to the ground. That's so powerful. And um, I really appreciated, yeah, how you, you did talk um, in the book about, um, you know, this is not just a, an issue of human society and well-being. It's, it's really the future of, the planet it's it's our it's our future to um you know either continue polluting and subjugating the planet in the way that we have been uh, especially you know as as western countries and um 
you know, to, to redefine that relationship, um, which is especially interesting, of course, because nature has so often been gendered as, as female. Um, mm, so there's, there's, there's that resonance for me too. Um, and I, I would love to shift a little bit to talking about maybe how men might be able to bring, uh, you know, to, to start using that interconnectedness and um, all of these skills, really these soft skills to family life. We've talked a little bit about the workplace and um, in this, in this feature, the, the author, um, Chris Perraro, he's talking about, uh, you know, this, this kind of incident he had with his family and um, where his, his son was, um, they were riding bikes and his son is um, struggling to ride. He, his legs are freezing up and, and you know, Chris catches himself when he's about to just shut down his son's vulnerability and his mindfulness practice lets him notice, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm rejecting his vulnerability. I'm denying it. And instead I'm going to stop and get curious and, and help him solve this issue. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about, or, or, uh, you know, what's worked in your families, um, or what you've seen work for other people. Yeah. Uh, ironically, I had a session this morning with a man who uh, is doing very well financially. He was a military officer and he has um, he has uh, five children, uh, uh, two, uh, one of which is severely disabled. And um, uh, he would and he had that child. Uh, very early on in his life. So he stepped out of his being a son to a responsible father of a disabled child. And so he found a way to cope with that by being pretty linear. Uh, we got to do this, we got to do this, we got to do this, and kept his kids and his, and his uh, now wives um, uh, sort of in, in a um, uh, regiment. And uh, he came to therapy having read the book. And um, he said, I, I, this isn't working for me. And um, uh, uh, he's, he's, he's really uh, having the courage to make changes and they're dramatic changes. For example, uh, I, I told Ed about this. He, he uh, uh, would have a discussion with his wife about something important, but he'd do it in his office where he was behind his desk and she was in front of his desk. So it was more like a, a business meeting then. And, and uh, he said, uh, uh, once we, we talked, uh, they needed to deal with some issue. And he said, I invited my wife in. I sat in front of my desk, I put a chair so that I could face her and I took her hand and uh, I assured her that what we're about to talk about is, uh, n is in, in no way about his unwavering love for her. And so he was using that language and, uh, and they had, she was blown away and um, uh, so they, they had this conversation and she said, what's that thing on your wrist? He said, um, I put this here, oh, he said, because I'm never going to take it off. Because every time you look at it, I want you to know how much I love you. And every time I look at it, I want to remember how much I love you and, and, and um, owe to you uh, for, for, yeah. And, uh, and to this day, uh, when we have sessions, I, I keep looking to make sure he, he, he has it on and he, and he always does. Um, and with his children, he said to me this morning, um, he said, I'm, I, I sat my two daughters down and I told them that um, uh, I'm no longer going to be tracking their progress as if it's like a flight. He said, um, but I'm going to pay a lot of attention to what you guys need and want and what you're experiencing. Um, and um, so he's shifting from from being the, the director to being a, an affectionate, warm human being. And uh, he's thrilled with himself because he's, he's getting paid off enormously, you know. 
Um, one thing he said is that I, I think I'm changing from, oh, God, dad's home to, oh, good, dad's home. I love that. Um, can, I, can I share another piece of that puzzle? Uh, yeah, Ed has such great stories, Amber, from his patients and from the M3 community. I, you could hear many more. Maybe you do want to hear some more. I, I just was going to share one that I just experienced in my, in, in my parenting uh, the other day that I think connects both both with the you know the liberating masculinity we're trying to develop but also to your point about the triggers and the mindfulness like it reminds me of the story of the guy on the bike you know your author Chris uh I was picking my daughter up from her soccer tryouts uh and it was unclear exactly where they were trying out I hadn't I never parked at this soccer field before so I wandered onto the soccer field trying to see my daughter Skyla and she was livid at me because I was like the embarrassing dad who didn't know where to pick her up. You know, she's 16 and she's like, I hate you so much for doing this. Uh, why can't you be like the other dad? And, and so I was triggered by that. You know, I'm like, how can you get mad at me? I'm here picking you up and like looking out to, you know, safely guide you home. Uh, but I, this is part of my practice of like recognizing that anger rising in me and like, taking a breath and kind of stepping away. And, and the two of us walked kind of separately, several, you know, the equivalent of several blocks back to our car. And I think I was able to make space for her feeling, you know, and, and be more empathetic. You know, I'm not sure you'd call it vulnerability on her part, but but certainly emotional, uh, emotional reaction. And, you know, I'm not sure I would have done that a couple of years ago, you know, before we wrote this book uh, to, to really be, uh, aware of and 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 use those practices of re reflection and um, p pausing and uh, noticing emotional uh, reactions and then sort of ma mastering them or at least you know making space for a, a more productive response. Amazing. Oh, go ahead. A, a, a. No, no. I was just um, just just marveling at what Ed just said. So. And I can I add that even a loving response, not just productive, but like caring and loving, you know, to that would add that too. Yeah, that's, that's such a, a powerful internal shift too. Um, and I, I can definitely relate in that, especially after spending over a year inside with my partner, you know, you, you, re, you relate to your family members in very kind of automated ways sometimes and sometimes it's noticing those habits that is mm. the even trickier part than or to, to me at least than you know noticing them at work or, or with other relationships um yeah yeah this has been um a fantastic 50 minutes and i could just keep asking you questions for more several more hours but um <laughs> i do want to let you both go and get on with your days in, in the next five minutes um but I would just like to ask, is there anything that you would have liked to bring up um, during this chat that I didn't mention? What a great question, Amber. As a, as a journalist person myself, that's, I, I always try to end, end things. So thank you for that question. There is so much that's promising about mindfulness helping men go from anger to peace, that we are so inclined and taught that anger is okay for us. Uh, and it's such a harmful thing, harmful force in the world. And if we can move more toward a peaceful, loving responses to when we are, when we are hurt uh, or sad, I think uh, that it would be good for the world. And mindfulness is, is, a, is a key way for us to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, in division 51 of, of the American Psychological Association, um, uh, uh, there's a lot of discussion within the division about how to respond to all of the the nightmarish things that are happening. And um, uh, my own perspective of that is the, the way to respond isn't from say shooting to shooting or, or uh, 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 sexual abuse to sexual abuse, but to give a louder voice to men who aren't doing that, to give a louder voice to men who are abhor that give uh, a louder voice to men who are um, uh, against that, but give them a form to, to, to express that so that um, 
uh, we could, we could, um, I, I, I use the example of uh, the movie Casablanca when, um, when the Germans started to, uh, the Nazis started to sing their anthem and uh, Rick nodded his head for the orchestra to play the French anthem. And the, and so many people chimed in on the French anthem that the Germans shut down. And that's, that's the metaphor that I'm using is like, let's give greater voice to all these men who want to live in peace and, 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 and abhor violence and want to change towards liberating masculinity. That there, there's very little, very little out there for them to have a form. So uh, if, you, if your magazine contributes to that, that's an enormous contribution. So thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. I, those are such beautiful statements to end on. Thank you so much, so much, both of you, for your time today. You're welcome. For all of your work. Thank you so much, Amber. And thank you. Mindful Senior Editor Amber Tucker in conversation with Ed Fraunheim and Ed Adams, authors of Reinventing Masculinity. What a conversation. So much to think about in what the Eds are saying. And we would love to hear your thoughts on all of this. You can write to us at yourwordsatmindful.org. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode of Real Mindful, perhaps you would leave us a review. You can do that on Spotify, iTunes, Google Podcasts. You can do that on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or, well, wherever you're listening from. Your review helps other listeners decide whether Real Mindful is right for them. If you're looking for a way to work with your own feelings and reactions to confined masculinity, that conversation about masculinity, or anything else that may be an issue in your own life, you might enjoy our weekly practice podcast, 12-Minute Meditation. Each week, we offer a new guided practice backed by neuroscientific research that reveals that 12 minutes of meditation a day can be enough to yield benefits like increased focus, clarity, calm, and compassion. And you can find 12-Minute Meditation at mindful.org and wherever fine podcasts are found. Try it out, and then let us know what you think. We'll return with another episode of Real Mindful in two weeks. Until then... Keep it playful, friend. Mm